Father, we thank you and praise you for the great gift and reality that is the communion of saints. Those many men and women who even now at this moment behold you face to face and pray for us, for the courage to drop the nets, to sign over the deed of our lives, to make the decision to follow your son who alone can bring us abundant life. Help us not only by the witness of their lives, but by their prayers to do as they have done. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So part of growing as a disciple is learning how to recognize God's voice. I once heard a man say that God is not like one of those old TVs. Remember these things? Some of you don't even know what that is. That's life before cable. You talked about how you had to move the antenna around to get the signal to come in clearly. I can remember when I was a kid, my brother and I, we would try to get the Lions games because you couldn't watch them in Detroit because they were always blacked out because they were never sold out. So we'd try to tune in the station out of Toledo and one of us would be moving the antenna around and then somehow we'd get it and be like, wait, don't move. I got it, which meant one person couldn't see the game, but that was all right. It was usually my brother, so I was fine with that. <laughs> but God's not like that. God knows how to talk to us. And Jesus promised that his sheep, that would be us, hear his voice. All we got to do is two things. We got to give God time, and then we got to learn how to discern whether or not it's him who's speaking to us. And there's easy ways to discern, at least initially, if what we hear is in sync with what God reveals in the scriptures and in what the church teaches, then there's a chance it's from God. If it's not in sync with what Scripture reveals and what the church teaches, then it's not from God. And at least in my case, I know oftentimes a lot of the things I hear are pretty clearly not from God. But sometimes they are. And I've learned over the years, maybe especially because I tend to be very visual, that the most powerful way that God speaks to me is through images. I want to share one of those with you, if I can, because as we continue our way through this pilgrimage that is rerouting, the image that I had, I think, is very fitting and helpful for many of us right now who are, for whatever reason, putting off the decision to sign over the deed of ownership of our lives. The image happened at a funeral about 10 days ago or so. And the man that we were bearing wasn't a member of the parish, but his daughter is our sister here. And by all accounts, he was and is a really good man. Married to his wife for 40 years, six kids, the last 30 years of his life, a daily communicant. And at least for the last number of years, he was pretty deliberate in making the time to tell especially his family, but not just his family, about the difference that Jesus had made in his life. He wasn't a saint, that's what his kids say, but he loved God deeply and he loved his neighbor. And that, after all, is what Jesus reduces the Ten Commandments down to. So funerals at our parish begin over there by the baptismal font. And we bless the body there. And then we process down the aisle way in the back of the church and get to the main aisle and finally bring the body up to the front. And as we were walking into the church proper, just as we got to about the cry room, I saw something. So I saw a crowd just stand and begin to applaud. But it wasn't, you know, one of those little golf claps. And it wasn't the reserved applause of, say, a concert at the DSO. It was loud. Actually, what I saw was more like a tunnel, the kind of tunnel that football players run out of onto a field. And as often as the case, I saw above the tunnel a crowd standing and 
Oftentimes in football games, they're pounding on top of the tunnel as the team comes out. Only in this case, it wasn't a team coming out. It was just one man. And the one man, as you can probably imagine, was the man that we were burying. Now that might sound rather fanciful to you, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually very much in line with scripture. I think it's exactly what we read in Hebrews chapter 12. The beginning of Hebrews 12 says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, that's us, by the way, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That passage follows immediately after what's commonly referred to as the hall of faith. Hebrews 11, or God's hall of fame, the only hall of fame that ultimately matters for that matter. Hebrews 11 is just this listing of hero after hero, saint after saint of the Old Testament. And all that they had done, the ways that they persevered and overcame whatever obstacles that they were facing. This massively diverse group of people. And then after describing them, we get to Hebrews 12 and the passage we just looked at, which is something like a word picture. And Hebrews is painting an image of heaven as a stadium. And the stands are packed with people, all the saints. And where are you and I? We're on the field, running around, playing the game, the game that we call life. I had another image a set of years ago that I'd like to share as well to build on this, because again, I think it fits with what it is that the Lord is trying to say to those of us, especially who are putting off out of fear making the decision to drop the nets, to sign the card, and to really sell out for Jesus. I've shared this image a number of times. I share it often at funerals, but I'd like to share it again. It happened about seven years ago. It was before I knew him. It was a Saturday night in November. I had this four o'clock mass here, went home. My brothers were out, I was all alone. It was lovely. Had nothing going on, which was rare. Made some dinner, headed downstairs to the basement, turned on the TV, watched a little college football. And I turn on the Nebraska-Texas A&M game taking place in College Station, Texas. Now, if you don't know anything about Texas A&M, their stadium and their crowd is known as the 12th man. And if you don't know anything about football, that's because football is played with 11 men. And so their stadium is considered to be the extra player, if you will. Why, you might ask? Well, because Texas A&M's crowd is not, shall we say, subdued and tranquil. In fact, if I can remember correctly, if you're a student there, it's more or less forbidden to sit during a home game. And they don't have cheerleaders. They got these guys. They call them yell leaders. They're actually voted on by the student assembly. They're all upperclassmen. And their task is to whip the crowd into a frenzy. And so Kyle Stadium, where Texas A&M plays, is 103,000 people. And it's what they call a whiteout. The whole crowd's in white. And the yell leaders have got them going. And they're going bonkers. 
Everybody's bouncing up and down. It's a double-decker stadium. The second level is literally bouncing as I'm watching this. And it's the pregame. It hasn't even started yet. So I'm sitting there, my feet up on a couch, bowl of pasta, a pound in front of me. I'm watching this, and I hear the Lord say, that's heaven, John. And I said, what? And he said, that's heaven. And then he took me back to that passage in Hebrews 12. And suddenly, I think I got it. See, fans don't go to a football game to watch a game. Not real fans. Not fans of Texas A&M. They go to change the game. That's why you want to play at home. Somehow, 103,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs, pounding on top of the seats in the stands, can inspire 11 men running around in a field to do things that they could never do in their backyard in front of mom and dad on a lounge chair. And that's the saints. The saints aren't looking down from heaven going, wow, that looks nasty down there. Glad I'm done with that. Good luck. They're not watching us. They're cheering for us. They're on their feet. They're praying for you and me. How do we know that? Because the great commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. And they do that in heaven. Who's their neighbor? That would be us. Nobody in heaven needs prayer. Everybody in heaven's perfect. So they're praying for us as we run and compete in the game that is called life. That means right now, at this very minute, you have family and friends who for you by name are on their feet cheering and praying for you. Let me take you to the man that we buried 10 days ago. I mentioned he was a daily communicant for the last 30 years or so of his life and that he was pretty outgoing and telling others, at least his family and some friends, about the difference that Jesus had made in his life. And so we hear things like that and we probably think maybe he was a deacon. Probably worked in the church somewhere. It's the kind of image we tend to have of people who do things like that. Actually, no. He was a coach in the National Football League. He coached for the Kansas City Chiefs. He coached for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he coached for the New York Giants. He coached some of the greatest players who've ever played the game. He coached in a Super Bowl. He was probably not what most people have in mind when they think of someone who's made the decision to drop the nets, to sign over the deed of ownership of their lives, and to radically follow Jesus. But people, that's the point. In fact, that's the whole point this weekend. Our road sign this week is, do not enter. And that expression has lots of meanings and lots of implications, but one of them is, really provoked by a fear that I know is rampant in a number of us right now. It's a fear that goes something like this. Do not enter. You make the decision to drop the nets to sign the card. It means you're going to have to give up everything you love. Lose all your individuality. You're going to become like them, a bunch of clones and maybe even clowns. Hardly. Let's look at the great cloud of witnesses and see who they are. Sure, there, there's some bishops, some priests, some deacons, some religious, but there's husbands and wives like Lewis and Zelie Martin, the mom and dad of St. Therese. There's single people like Pier Giorgio Frassati. There's people who committed murder like Alessandro Serenelli. And there's people who lived seemingly always really good lives like 
Father Solanus Casey, who's buried down at St. Bonaventure's in Detroit. There's people like Maria Goretti, who is a model of chastity. And there's other people like St. Margaret of Cortona, who battled with chastity and committed adultery. There's politicians like Louis of France and Stephen of Hungary. There's professors like Albert and Thomas. There's former diehard atheists like Edith Stein. There's doctors like Gianna Mola, lawyers like Thomas More, and scientists like Jerome Lejeune. There's young people like Kazito, who's the patron of our sister community over in Uganda, and Antonietta Mayo, who's a, about to be the youngest canonized saint who suffered greatly with cancer as a child. And there's old people like Mother Teresa. There's soldiers like Sebastian and Martin and Ignatius. There's people who dedicated themselves to the poor, like Martin de Pors, and people who dedicated themselves to the sick, like Saint Damien. There's people who suffered horrific abuse, slavery, torture, and had to learn to forgive those who had hurt them, like Josephine Baquita. There's folks who had conversions when they were children, like Saint Therese, and there's others who took decades to finally make the decision to drop the nets, sign the card, and surrender to Jesus, like Augustine. There's athletes, there's coaches, there's CEOs. There's people with interests and loves, just like all the interests and loves of everybody here. There is no one size fits all in heaven. The only single thing that they all had and have in common is that sooner or later, they had a life-changing encounter with Jesus and as a result, they dropped the net, signed the card, surrendered to him, and said, Lord, I will do whatever you want. I know in my own case, I've known God since I was a child. I've prayed since I was conscious, or so it seems. But don't take that to mean that I followed him my whole life. I, like perhaps many of you, even still perhaps, very deliberately, very intentionally, and very willfully put off making the decision to follow him. Because I, perhaps like some of you even still today, was deathly afraid of what would happen to me if I did that. I had going on in my head the same voice that's going on in not a few of our heads in this parish right now. A voice that sounds like this. Do not enter. You drop the net, sign the card, surrender to Jesus, you're going to lose your identity. You're going to have to walk away from all the things that you love. Do not enter. You're going to lose control of your life. Who can live like that? Do not enter. The Christian life is less, not more. You do this, you're probably never going to have fun ever again. Do not enter. You're going to become like them. Bunch of Jesus freaks. Do not enter. You're not good enough. Not with all the things that you've done. If they knew who you were, what you've done, they would show you to the door and send you to the church down the street. Do not enter. You decide to follow Jesus, God's going to make you do things you hate and you don't want to do. Do not enter. It's going to be way, way too hard. Any of those sound familiar to any of us? because I hear them. Let me mention one more, because I hear it said often, usually about us, it goes something like this. Do not enter, OLGC, 
That's for uber Catholics. That's for the spiritually elite. That's for the ones that got it all together. They don't want your kind there. Nonsense. I'm the pastor of this parish. My life is seriously disordered. I don't have it all together. I hear your confessions, sit in my office, talk to you. Nobody of you's got it all together either. This parish isn't for the elite. There is no elite. Here's what this parish is for. The parish is for anybody who's serious about wanting to learn more about Jesus. The parish is for those who are hungry for more. It's for those of us who are tired of the same old, same old. It's for those of us who think Jesus just might be telling the truth when he says, I have come not simply that you may have life, but abundant life. I don't know about you, but I want more. I've tried everything this world can offer, and it's not enough. I got bigger appetites than what this world can satisfy. I got a hole inside of me that only God can satisfy. If there's abundant life to be had, then I want it. And in looking at all that we've looked at with what Jesus has done for us over these past few weeks, I trust him and his good father. Let me share with you finally two last images. One from a saint from hundreds and hundreds of years ago and one that I just had happen to me about four months ago. The saint is Augustine, whose mother is the woman who's depicted in that statue at the end of the main aisle here. Monica, his mother, was married to a man who was an alcoholic and abusive. They had two sons, one of whom was named Augustine. And Augustine was someone that Monica prayed for 30 years for his conversion. He had massive appetites. He was hungry for truth. He was hungry for goodness. He was hungry for beauty. And he finally heard the gospel proclaimed by a man named Ambrose one day. And it so attracted him and he knew it was true, and he so wanted to drop the net and sign the card, but he couldn't. Because he had one massive obstacle in his case that was holding him back. And the one obstacle for him was chastity. He just didn't see how he could possibly live without indulging all his appetites. Until one day he had a vision. And the vision was this huge host of saints, this huge train, something like that maybe, men and women, young and old, all of whom sooner or later had made a decision to turn around, to reroute, if you will, to surrender, to live chastely. And they were walking by him. And as they walked by him, he heard them all in unison with one voice ask a question. And the question was this. Can you not do what we have done? And as soon as he heard that, he wasn't just inspired by their example. He understood that they were praying for him. And he found the courage to drop the net, sign over his life, become a disciple of Jesus, and he goes on to become one of the greatest figures of human history. The other image happened at my mom's house about four months ago. I was sitting with her around the kitchen table in her kitchen, and as often, as always, is the case when I see my mom. Sooner or later, the conversation turns to my dad and my brother, who I lost last year. So we're sitting there talking, and as I'm sitting there, I see this picture on a cart and I say, where in the world did you get that? She says, what? I said, that. She said, oh, son, that's always been there. I said, no, it hasn't. I've never seen that in my life. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I was looking at a picture of my dad and my brother, just the two of them. 
I didn't even know they ever went to a game alone in a stadium in the order that they went, looking at me as if to say, come on, John. You can do this. Drop the net. Sign the deed. Come on, John. It's so worth it. Come on, John. Just give it all to Jesus. Just be great. You have, right now, at this moment, family and friends in heaven looking at God. They're not watching you. They're on their feet cheering for you, praying for you to run the race, to fight the fight, drop the net, sign the card, and let him do whatever he wants in your life. We are indeed surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. There is nothing more worth doing than giving everything to God. So don't be afraid. Don't listen to the voices that are trying to tell you and me, do not enter. Don't pay them any more attention. Jesus is telling us in the scriptures to keep our eyes fixed on him. He tells us that his sheep hear his voice and that face, or something even more magnanimous than that face, right now, is looking at you and me, saying this. Enter. Of course, all the while, he's also standing outside the door that is the mind and the heart that is your life and mine, knocking, wanting to know if he can really, finally, come in. Will we say enter?